What happened before San Antonio police shot and killed a man in front of his house on the city's west side? The I am Vanessa Guillen bill being introduced in Washington. The changes that are hoped it will make within the military. And we've got a nice little speckling of some showers and non-severe storms out on radar this afternoon. And while you could see a little rain today, your best shot is actually coming up on Thursday. We'll talk about that and a check of the tropics coming up. The COVID-19 pandemic back in the spotlight. Now, despite what some health officials are saying, the president still believes we could see a vaccine before Election Day. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is releasing his vaccine plan. I'm Daryl Fortas from the White House with the very latest. Plus, we take a look at a task force at Trinity University made up of students and faculty. Their top priorities, the census and voting. The News at 5 starts right now. At first and five, a San Antonio man shot and killed in his own front yard as police tried to arrest him. Today we learn more about the man who was killed, 55-year-old Daryl Zamalt Sr. Dylan Collier piecing together the police reports and learning why his loved ones say it's an inaccurate picture of who he was. It's really difficult to grieve when there's a, lot, a lack of clarity as to how this went down. Celeste Brown and other loved ones of Daryl Zamalt Sr. coming to his defense this afternoon, pushing back against what they called a rushed narrative put out by the San Antonio Police Department. Yesterday, five officers, three in plain clothes and two in uniform, attempted to take Zamalt into custody on active warrants. Police say he hit one of them with a can of paint, then grabbed an officer's gun during a struggle forcing another officer to shoot and kill him. SAPD officials have not released body-worn camera footage of the shooting. This afternoon, SAPD officials did release several reports involving Zamalt dating back nearly a year, filed by an ex-girlfriend that included allegations Zamalt harassed her in person and over the phone and tampered with her vehicle. The defenders also obtained a warrant against Zamalt for stalking, claiming in early July he dragged the woman, injuring her, then left the scene. Brown called the accusations false, saying he was married three decades to his wife before she passed away and never had a single incident of domestic violence. So if he was in love with the love of his wife for 30 years, all I have to say is look at that. And Mayor Ron Nuremberg released a statement this afternoon that reads in part, quote, I am requesting that the footage be released as soon as the investigation is complete. It is in the public interest for San Antonians to be able to view the video themselves. The city claims it is not allowed to release body worn camera footage during an ongoing investigation. State law actually says that they may withhold it while an investigation is ongoing. That's why you've seen other major police departments in Texas in cities like Dallas, Arlington, Fort Worth, Austin, and even Houston last week began to release footage from officer shootings when they shoot and kill a person that is in their custody, even before those investigations are completed. Reporting live outside Public Safety Headquarters, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Dylan. We're still working to learn the name of a man who was killed in the crossfire at a southeast side apartment complex overnight. It happened just before four this morning at a complex near Pecan Valley Drive in East South Cross. San Antonio police say the suspect 20 year old Giovanni Benjamin got into a fight with someone at the complex. He later returned with a rifle and bulletproof vest. Witnesses told police they heard people arguing and when the 49 year old victim peeked around a corner to see what was going on, that's when he was hit by a bullet. A second man who was sleeping in his apartment was also injured. He was taken to the hospital and is expected to be OK. Benjamin facing a murder charge and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. We now know the name of a 37 year old man killed in a crash near I-35 in Thousand Oaks yesterday. He's been identified as Simon Daniel Specter. San Antonio police say that his vehicle was hit by an 18 wheeler that may have had its brakes fail. One other person take to the hospital in serious condition. The truck driver was not hurt. An electrical fire is said to be the blame for forcing two brothers out of their west side home this morning. One of the brothers called 911 after learning his home on Fidel Street was on fire and his brother was still inside. Firefighters say the man who was inside made it out safely with the help of the neighbors. According to the fire department, the fire started in a back room. It was likely caused by too many electrical appliances being plugged in at the same time. In total, the fire caused about $30,000 in damage. 
The I am Vanessa Guillen Act being proposed in Congress today. That bill, which has bipartisan support, aims not only to change how the U.S. military responds to missing service members, but also how it makes sexual harassment claims within the military a crime. It would also move prosecution of sexual assault and harassment cases out of the military chain of command. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has agreed to bring that bill to a vote on the House floor this fall. The bill named after slain Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen. She disappeared in April. Her remains were found in late June. Even in a year with a global pandemic, Democrats and Republicans can't find much common ground on developing a vaccine for COVID-19. President Donald Trump wants a vaccine by the end of the year, if not sooner, while Democrats want to follow the science, not the calendar. Daryl Forges is at the White House with the latest on pandemic politics. Yeah, that's right, Ursula. COVID-19 pandemic is back in the spotlight. Now, President Trump is speaking right now in the briefing room about the pandemic and about a vaccine. He says he expects a vaccine to be available before Election Day. Meanwhile, Joe Biden says that he trusts the science, he trusts the vaccine, but he doesn't trust the president. President Donald Trump's aggressive timeline for a COVID-19 vaccine. We're very close to having a vaccine. We're going to have a vaccine in a matter of uh, a matter of weeks. It will be ready before the end of the year and maybe much sooner than that. Has become a 2020 political issue on the campaign trail. On Wednesday, the Trump administration released a vaccine distribution strategy. Once a vaccine receives the green light from the FDA, the goal is to have it on its way to administration sites within 24 hours. But Democrats say they're worried election politics are at play. If the president had any modicum of fidelity to science, no one would have any doubts. The American people have overwhelming doubts. Democratic nominee Joe Biden on Wednesday delivered a speech discussing how his administration would handle a vaccine and try to draw a clear distinction between his strategy and the president's. The stakes are too high. American families have already suffered and sacrificed too much. So let me be clear. I trust vaccines. I trust scientists. But I don't trust Donald Trump. How the American public views this issue could be critical this November. A recent ABC News poll shows just 31 percent of U.S. adults trust what Trump has said about the coronavirus. The FDA and CDC have repeatedly said that a vaccine would not be broadly available to the public until it's determined to be safe. With the coronavirus sure to be on the minds of most voters this November, it may be difficult for politicians to separate politics and science. And Ursula, there's been a lot of confusion when it comes to when a vaccine will be available. We've heard health experts like Dr. Anthony Fauci say that a vaccine will be available maybe towards the end of this year, early next year. The head of the CDC, Dr. Robert Redfield, says a vaccine may not be available for the general public until sometime next summer. Now, the president is still adamant saying that there, a vaccine will be available by October before Election Day. And he says that he's expected to have 100 million doses to be distributed by the end of this year. Live at the White House, Ursula, back to you. Daryl, we're hearing that there may be some movement on the COVID-19 stimulus stalemate that's been going on. What's the latest on that? Yeah, Ursula, there's, that's still a big question when it comes to the stimulus. When it comes to this situation, the chief of staff for the president, Mark Meadows, says that something has to be done within the next five to 10 days or within the next week or so. Now, some Republicans in the Senate say they're willing to go higher above that $500 billion price tag they did with their skinny deal they passed last week. Now, Nancy Pelosi says that she's still looking for a stimulus deal as much as $2 trillion. So there's still big, uh, a big gap when it comes to the numbers between the Senate Republicans and the House Democrats. Now, when it comes to both lawmakers, uh, both leaders of the House and the Senate and the presidential administration coming in to talk about a deal that is yet still to be determined, Ursula. A lot of room there. You're right. Thank you, Daryl Forges, reporting live from Washington. It is going to be an eventful year for college students beside the pandemic. There's the census. There's a presidential election. Trinity University is trying to make sure its students are counted and that they vote. A census and voter engagement task force was created last spring, made up of both students and faculty. Although the census is still a priority, they're preparing students to vote in November, but not only registering voters, but also training them to help answer questions about what they need to know about voting. The response so far? We've seen good responses to all of our emails and our social media posts. 
And right now at the end of September and into October, uh, things are really going to start picking up. They say even Trinity professors are starting off their courses by reminding students to register and vote. We'll have more about their efforts coming up at six. And don't forget about the upcoming voter registration deadline. It is Monday, October 5th. If you're not sure whether you're registered to vote, we do have the information on how to check your status and how to register. It's right now on ksat.com. Just look for this story on the homepage. Got some breaking news we want to bring you right now with Sky 12. This is from the city's south side. Sky 12 flying over the 1300 block of Mission Grande. It looks like an apartment complex there. There is a report of a shooting and police are there working. You see an ambulance on the scene as well. Uh, doesn't appear to be any movement in or out of the apartment. We will work to get some more information for you and we'll bring it to you when it comes in. Outside with live cam, 88 degrees at the airport. Kind of looks a little hazy out there this afternoon. And we have had some showers and storms develop during the heat of the day today. That is good because it has been hot and muggy so far. Here's a look at Doppler radar. Locally, we're going to zoom in pretty closely here. We do have a nice downpour, even some lightning strikes here in far eastern Bear County between China Grove and Kirby there between 82 and I-10. That's where some of the heaviest rain is. Uh, and even some rain now extending down farther into southern Bear County closer to Mitchell Lake, a couple of showers off to the west closer to Von Ormy and then elsewhere. We've just got some nice downpours out there. Checking in with our weather watchers temperature wise. Generally the 80s, 87 in Eagle Pass, 88 here in Shirts, 90 in Holotus, 85 up in Bulverde this afternoon. Sally now a tropical storm after making landfall very early this morning as a category two hurricane. A lot of the widespread rain moving inland, but the flooding issues caused by Sally, they are going to linger for several days. We'll talk more about the tropics and I'll have your full forecast coming up. Ursula. Thank you, Katie. Ben, as you mentioned, Sally has weakened to a tropical storm, but while it was a hurricane, it had a lasting impact on several Gulf Coast states. ABC's Elwin Lopez takes a look at the, some of the damage that caught people by surprise. Slow moving Sally lumbering inland, slamming into Alabama and Florida. In Orange Beach, oh my gosh, people caught off guard. Yeah, I've lived here my whole life, and I guess we just did not expect that. I think a lot of people um, didn't realize what this hurricane was going to do. And in nearby Pensacola, massive flooding and tropical storm wind gusts wiping out a portion of the Three Mile Bridge. We anticipate the evacuations could literally be in the thousands. So it's going to be uh, a long time, folks, you know, for us to come out of this thing. Roads completely submerged. The Florida National Guard racing to evacuate people as life-threatening storm surge and flash floods continue to plague the region. Sally already knocking out power for more than half a million customers across three states. Today marks 16 years since that same area near Gulf Shores, Alabama was ravaged by Hurricane Ivan, but Sally is a bit different. She is not packing Ivan's winds, but she will be bringing rain for days. In Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, Elwin Lopez, ABC News. Food allergies, you may not know how to, you developed them, but you might have at least one. Up next, what researchers have uncovered about the mystery and their advice to parents. Food allergies affect an estimated 8% of U.S. children, according to the CDC. And a new study suggests the time of year that a baby is born actually can put them at higher risk. However, parents can help. There is no cure for food allergies. The CDC now estimates one in 13 children, or about two students per classroom, have an immune system that mistakenly responds to food as if it were harmful. But researchers at National Jewish Health say many allergic conditions likely start in infancy with eczema, leading to food allergies, asthma, and hay fever later in childhood. And when you're born plays into it, according to the study's lead author, Dr. Jessica Wee. We found that children born in the fall, which is September, October, and November, 
are at higher risk of developing these allergic conditions. Why is the million dollar question and something still being studied specifically when it comes to how temperature changes affect the skin? We have a couple ongoing studies right now even following pregnant moms and then their future babies, um, looking at the skin barrier, looking at blood work, looking at different exposures that they have in their environment, and then seeing which ones um, develop allergies. We says parents can protect their children by practicing like good skin care. Put all the different creams on the baby, um, kind of make sure the, the skin stays smooth and is healthy and is well hydrated. Researchers say that children with eczema often have high levels of a harmful bacteria on their skin and that weakens the skin's ability to keep out the allergens and the pathogens. Let's go live to Sky 12 right now and off in the distance. I'm guessing those are the rain showers. Yes, that you were talking about Katie. Yes, I, I th they've got to be looking. I think they're looking east because it is in eastern Bear County yep. that we have a nice little thunderstorm that has popped up. No severe weather out there. So if you hear a rumble of thunder, no worries. We don't have any severe weather in the cards this evening. Just some nice healthy rainfall for some of our yards. So here we are at five o'clock. Here's a look at the next five hours of your day. Some scattered showers will be possible through about six, seven o'clock, and you'll see our rain chances kind of gradually taper off to around 20% later tonight. But I do think even through the overnight hours, we could have a couple of isolated showers out there. Temperatures are in the seventies up in the hill country, 79 in Kerrville, 91 in New Braunfels, 90 in Catula. So nice to see some uh, rain developed on radar this afternoon. And again, no severe weather few not severe storms out there. Yeah, and even some shower activity up in a portion of Kerr and Gillespie counties down to the southwest 35 Pearsall all the way to Carrizo Springs, even just west of Catula there. A couple of non severe storms putting down some nice rainfall uh, down from Wilson to Carnes County. Pretty quiet for now, but we do have some rain moving through Goliad and also some rain as far east as Hallettsville and Lavaca County. Very nice to see that and again a little closer to home. I do believe this is the cell that Sky 12 was looking at there. It's popped up pretty nicely. We had some activity uh, right along 410 over the last hour or so that kind of fizzled out, but then picked itself back up there in southeastern Bear County. So some nice healthy rain falling from China Grove essentially all the way down to Mitchell Lake. This is moving southeast. So uh, from Calaveras Lake, Elmendorf there and eventually down into Wilson County, this little cell could wander your direction. But again, no severe weather, just some nice rainfall few nice rumbles of thunder and that will be about it. Obviously, Tropical Storm Sally, now Tropical Storm Sally, getting your attention off to the east. But here in Texas, the reason why we started to pick up our rain chances today and while they're actually peak tomorrow is because we've got a nice piece of upper level energy that will swing over South Texas that will provide some lift. It'll tap into the moisture we've got in place and that's why we'll actually see our rain chances peak tomorrow. So we're looking at a 40% chance of rain tomorrow starting to taper off a bit by Friday and then a really, really nice week Again, no rain in the cards, but it is going to feel great. And we'll talk about why coming up here shortly. Uh, again, another look at Tropical Storm Sally. Maximum sustained wind 60 miles per hour. Sally just crawling off to the northeast at 7 miles per hour. That's why flooding will end up being uh, the mark with this system is because it just moves so slowly. Radar estimates some spots from the Alabama over to Florida Gulf Coast have received more than two feet of rain in the past 48 hours, so big time flooding issues there. It's busy elsewhere across the Atlantic Basin. Paulette, Vicki, Teddy, of course, we've got Sally here closer to home. We've got an area that needs to be watched there in the open Atlantic and also an area with high odds of potential development over the next two to five days here in the Gulf. 70% chance that this becomes at least our next tropical depression in the next five days. And don't let this concern you too much, though, just because it is a bit closer to home. This area of shower and thunderstorm activity there in the Gulf is not going to move very much over the next few days. Part of the reason why is because that low that helps us out with rain tomorrow kind of keeps it suppressed down to the south. We've also got a nice frontal boundary dropping into Texas late Friday into early this weekend. That's also going to keep that rain suppressed down to the south, but that front is going to help us out with lower humidity this weekend. So tomorrow, another decent chance of rain, scattered showers and non severe storms possible. We start to clear out Friday. We get some drier air in here this weekend. Mornings in the low to mid 60s. It's going to feel pretty Nice this weekend, guys. Something to put a smile on our face. Yeah, you had me at lower humidity. <laughs> and Nebraska football. And Nebraska football is back. Yes. <laughs> My alma mater. 
I, I was joking with a friend. I guess I won't be a Longhorn fan. No. Aww. I'll go back to the Huskers. And you know what? The Big Ten is back in. But what caused their change of heart? When we come back, they'll let us know why they're about face. And also when we come back, Kawhi is out of the playoffs after the Clippers meltdown coming up. The Denver Nuggets are in the Western Conference Finals. They're coming back right after being down three games to one against the Clippers in big board sports. But first, the Big Ten is going to play football in the fall. After all, that decision announced today that the conference begin play on the weekend of October 24th. We'll attempt to play eight games in eight weeks of the conference championship on December 19th. The reason for the about phase is that university chancellors and presidents now feel they have more confidence in medical information and daily testing availabilities for the coronavirus. And that's also after pressure from players, coaches, and fans after the Big 12, SEC, and ACC elected to play after the Big Ten originally backed out in August due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We will play eight games uh, plus one, uh, a very unique champion week, champions week. Teams from the East and West will match up two versus two, three versus three, four versus four, et cetera, uh, with the championship game pl being played uh, at, at the end of that week. All right, now that leaves just the Pac-12 as the only Power 5 conference not electing to play for now. The Denver Nuggets have shocked the Los Angeles Clippers 104-89 and are now in the Western Conference Finals where they'll face a Laker to decide who gets to go to the NBA Finals. Everybody thought it would be the battle for L.A. And the Clippers went up three games to one on the Nuggets only to watch Denver win three straight. And in the seventh exciting game, the Clippers' two biggest stars, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, wilted in the fourth quarter, not scoring a single point and going 0 for 11 from the field in a winner-take-all game seven. And this is not the first time Doc Rivers has blown a three-game to one lead in the NBA. Try three times. I'm the coach, and, and I'll take any blame uh, for it. But we didn't meet our expectations, uh, clearly, uh, because we had, uh, in my opinion, we, we'd still be playing. And it's being called the block of all time in NBA history. The Miami Heat's Bam out of bio's rejection of the Celtics' Jason Tatum in game one of the Eastern Conference Finals. Look at this. Tatum is about to throw that down. In fact, he's over the cylinder when Bam comes in at the last second, and boom, Deny! Take another look at this at Adebayo's hand. It's been all the way back and still he has the power to keep the ball out of the basket. Nothing short of incredible as a result. Miami takes game one, 117-114 in overtime. Wow! That is amazing. Impressive to at say At a this. crucial time <laughs> to come up with a block like Never that. seen it like that. Crazy. Thank yeah. you, Greg. We'll be right back. We have some breaking news before we go. We just received a memo from the city saying the mayor's requesting a complete review of SAPD's body worn camera policy. Uh, this happening just hours after.